Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to begin by welcoming you all, whether you're attending along with us um, on this beautiful uh, Thursday afternoon or uh, you're watching a recording of this discussion. My name is Jérôme Melanson, or Jérôme Melanson. I teach at the University of Regina in French and Francophone Intercultural Studies and in Philosophy. I also have roles around uh, research on living heritage and around reconciliation. Um, I'm a settler with Quebecois and French, Canadian, French, Irish, and English, uh, English ancestry. I am uh, hosting this event from Oskanaka Asisteki uh, on the uh, traditional territory of the Nehiyawak in East Nepec, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakoda, and on the homeland of the Métis. Uh, the city of Regina is on Treaty 4 territory. As you know by now, um, there have been calls to remove the statue of Johnny McDonald in Victoria Park. And these have led uh, the city of Regina to undertake a legacy re review. Many know by now of McDonald's ge um, genocidal actions and policies uh, from the creation of residential schools to the weaponization of famines and epidemics and the withholding of help, uh, which were some of the factors leading to the signing of treaties and establishment of reserves. These actions are not secondary to the creation of Canada for which he is celebrated. They made Canada possible by clearing the plains to echo the tale of my colleague Jim, uh, James Daschet's book. Without necessarily focusing on this history, this event seeks to educate the public at the University of Regina, in the city of Regina and beyond, about indigenous experiences tied to McDonald and the statue by giving voice to four panelists. So this event is hosted by the Living Heritage um, Identities, Communities, Environments Research Cluster as part of its sharing series and also as part of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Town Halls at the U of R. It's made possible by the Humanities Research Institute, the University of Regina Dr. John Archer Library, and the Department of Visual Arts uh, and the Faculty of MAP, all of whom I want to thank profusely here. So thank you. Um, it was important to, to me and to some of my colleagues here to host this event so that we could share what we were learning um, extend our discussions more broadly and help set the stage more broadly also for the legacy re review. Alex King, who is the curator for the University of Regina's President's Arts Collection, uh, David Garneau, whom I'll introduce in a minute, and myself had already collaborated to um, first draft a letter in support of the petition to remove the statue of Johnny McDonald, along with many members of the cultural and heritage organizations. Francisco Fernellini, who is the director of the Humanities Research Institute, and Emily Grafton, who co-organizes the um, EDI Town Halls, also saw with us the importance and the relevance of this event and helped make it all happen. Uh, we've also had great support from AV Services and the communications teams at the university uh, so that we can run this uh, session as smoothly as possible. Um, that means that you're only able to see the hosts and panelists and not each other. Um, you can, however, ask questions at any point uh, through the Q&A function. Uh, we'll, um, uh, we'll get to these at the end of the event. So first we'll have four presentations that will last approximately 15 minutes. Um, and after that, I'll read these questions for our panelists uh, to answer. Uh, please ask your questions at any point uh, when they're ready. Um, we'll get to them uh, at the end, like I said. If you identify yourself and your role, I might also just unmute you and draw on you to ask the question yourself. I'm also going to right now share two links, one to the petition you can make up your, your mind if you haven't done so already. And one more to the CD's legacy review uh, so that you can um, uh, sign up to uh, get the uh, updates. So although you can't chat, you'll be able to see it here. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our four panelists. Kerry uh, Belgard, uh, uh, oh, sorry, Kerry um, Belgard uh, uh, Opunicha um, instigated the petition to have the statue removed and protested at the set of the statue over the spring and summer. She is a 60s scooper, a filmmaker, and owner of her own brand new First Nations production company, Brown Bear Club Films. She's an activist for her people, a mother, and a cocoon. David Garno is a professor of visual arts at the University of Regina. His practice includes painting, curation, and critical writing. Our third panelist will be Janine Jen Wendell. Uh, Wendell. She's an interdisciplinary artist, filmmaker, and educator who is based out of Regina, but working at the Banff uh, Center for the Arts uh, and the Creativity as an Associate Director of Indigenous Arts. Uh, Janine's uh, artistic practice focuses, focuses on family, culture, and community. She utilizes art and film for social change, 
uh, as was key in the journey for the Regina Indian Industrial School burial site to gain both municipal and provincial designation. And Adam Martin is the executive director of Sigawaywak, the First Nation Artist Collective and a visual artist. Um, I believe you've definitely heard enough from me now. I'll ask each panelist to introduce themselves further if, they've, if I've forgotten or left out anything. My apologies for anything I might have mispronounced between my accent, uh, my two accents and my, uh, my stammering. And uh, we'll begin with uh, Kerry. Francais, bonjour and welcome. I'm from Treaty 6, but I live here on Treaty 4. This day I'd like to honor my ancestors and invite them to guide our discussion. First, I'd like to call out again to the museums in Canada for the return of our ceremonial pieces, tribal artifacts, regalia, and artwork. This in itself was an act of cultural genocide under the government of Macdonald and should be part of this plan. Possibly by making a website where the articles can be discovered and then located. Many families have lost ceremonial articles that were intended to stay within the family and then be passed down from generation to generation. Second, to utilize the space where the statue stood with different types of floral from Saskatchewan or the different medicines we see all over. Beautify the area and that is healing. To idolize man or being is not recommended. Third, if the statue remains or is relocated, add the real information of what he did the attempted assimilation with his residential schools and a call for removal of children from their own parents and with the promise of returning us as civilized people. He was the art architect of the Indian Act, which launched the government of Canada on an ever increasingly and repressive series of action policies directed toward the assimilation of us the first peoples of Canada. I'm a product of the 60s scoop and I will never stop telling my story, the real horror story that is my life. The attempted genocide I have endured since the 1970s. I will never stop telling how I live without my mother and my children live without their cookum because in all reality, residential school took her. The different types of abuse I endured will never go away, but I have tried to heal and move forward for those that will spew hatred and racism with comments on how we should get over it and, and uh, to go back where I came from. I'm teaching others that it's okay to go forward, but the racists and the cowards won't stop to see that part because really, because of my skin color, they don't want to hear it. I was raised in a non-First Nations home too, but because I'm dark, people don't see that. I was educated in your school system and hidden away from my culture and the beauty that lays ahead in ceremony in our gatherings. What the eye sees is one thing, what the heart knows is another. Let's not relish the fact that he was a prime minister, but a murderer of children and a martyr of people that kindly shared land because we assumed they would be fair. He only cared about abusing the culture right out of us. What with a lot of these parents that adopted or, or fostered us, we're listening to the government, the agency of social services and assimilating us due to cultural genocide. Now look at us. They call us welfare bums where we nurse the land and our wounds and return to get their education because that's how we learn now. Look what they do with their land. They tear it up, sell it, burn it, degrade it, kill it. They walk all over us while there's homelessness and people starving right here in Regina and probably in your communities as well. But because we're assimilated, we walk over them and forget that they are human too. As I stood beside John A. McDonald, it sickened me and it angered me that he still stands there pointing. The rudest gesture yet that I was taught, very impolite. He looks mean and the spirit the statue cares remains there. You can almost hear the cries of our people in pain as you stand there. My chief from James Smith told me not to let him look at me while I was standing outside of the statue to cover his face. Let's talk about some of my history in regards to the statue. 
My Mushroom is Napache, Iron Body. He is a warrior. He rode horseback. He was a strong, lethal force. Chief Big Bear's war chief, wandering spirit, alongside Big Bear's own son, and Matthews, had enough of the oppression and suffering of the whole tribe. They decided to fight back after the April Fool's incident. For those of you that don't know, the Plains Cree were suffering from the decline of the buffalo population. Indigenous groups came to rely on government rations, which were administered by local Indian agents. This was often a source of contentions amongst the people. There was instances of insufficient or spoiled rations, even down to the Blackfoots. Uh, when they were found dead, they had grass in their stomachs. So now as the conservative and liberal, to liberal parties out of power, they pressured one another to cut more of these programs off that were helping our, our people. Starvation and politics strained the already tense relationships between our tribe and the government. Under government order, Big Bear's band, along with my grandfather, were re relocated to Frog Lake with minimal provisions of government assistance. The local Indian agent named Thomas Quinn, noted by historians as being a very mean-spirited and little man, completely lacking in compassion. He once summoned the natives around Frog Lake to the ration house in promise of food, only to declare to them that it had been an April Fool's prank and they would receive nothing. This is quoted from Wikipedia. There's lots I haven't mentioned that went on in detail, but since my experience of retelling history at the statue, a lot of people do not know the history of this prime minister guy and that the Indian Act was also designed by him, which led to a lot of our oppression. My motion was fed up. He, along with the seven other warriors, took matters into their own hands, despite Big Bear's uh, warning. Big Bear was the peace chief. The people were starving, destitute, and diseased. In April 22nd, 1885, Wandering Spirit shot Agent Quinn dead. The other warriors slayed others there to avenge the starving people. They all hung for their crimes without knowing the language spoken at the trial and without their own legal counsel. The presiding judge was told before the trial his own home had burnt down in Fort Pitt siege and that my grandfather was also involved in. And some believe he brought that hostility of it all to the final decision of the warriors. The government wanted to make the hanging a, a warning to other First Nations peoples, what happens when you fight back. On November 28, 1885, under John A. Macdonald's orders, they were all hung. It was Canada's largest mass hanging. Present in the audience were residential school children from Battleford, and the tribe itself was marched out and made to witness their own warriors' death. Of the eight warriors, one was 15 years old. Also, in 1885, McDonald's government enacted the Chinese Immigration Act. McDonald told the House of Commons that if the Chinese were not excluded from Canada, quote, the Aryan character of the future of British America shall be destroyed, unquote. He built the railway that tested our way of life too, and then used the Chinese to build a railroad that took many lives and hurt many families in the same way in our parts of this Canada. I brought this all up to let all know that we aren't the only race that John A. picked on. Racism is sad and hard to live with. It deeply traumatized me my entire life, not knowing where I fit in and then experiencing a horrific attack at the statue by a man angry and spitting and tearing down our red dress to honor our murdered and missing. He threw money at me to repay the sign he tore. I endeared a lot of people angered just by our presence there was even an old man disabled with an oxygen tank, and he still had that strength to come up and tell us that a young couple ripping the sign off and calling us names, the tremendous racist feedback we got from the media articles. I have even had First Nations people telling me, sadly, that they had no problem with him being there. After the two weeks I stayed there, I returned home for work reasons and my family responsibilities. I had to pray and rejuvenate my spirit. It is sad when our people are colonized so much that they show hatred to one another that is fighting for all. It made me realize how much we need, we need to do here. So let's remain strong on racism, especially teaching our youth and students how we can beat this if we stand together and show by example, re-educate and relearn our history. I'd like to organize a day against racism, racism as soon as possible. 
just have a day of music and healing and to show everyone we are not that racist place and we want a better vagina for our families. There are already supporters standing up such as Camp Justice and SAS Coalition Against Racism. Miigwech, thank you all for hearing me. I'd like to thank Jerome Melancon and David Garneau and especially Ali King for initially approaching me at the statue and inquiring if I were interested in her gathering letters of support from the arts and universities here in Regina. I am very honored to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Um, our next uh, speaker um, will, sorry, I have another smile list here, uh, it will be uh, David Garneau. <clears throat> Kerry, this is the first time I've uh, met you and I appreciate your being on the front lines there. Um, it, it made me think, you know, I'm, I'm not an art historian, but I think in art history's terms, and uh, in 1967, which was one of the first times Indigenous people were allowed to have their own voice in a national, actually an international forum was at Expo 67, and they had the Indigenous Pavilion. And uh, all of the men who were involved, the, the male artists, the male organizers, um, are always lauded, but it was... Uh, a whole bunch of women, young girls really, who were there taking the questions and the abuse like day after day and their voices have never been recorded telling what that was like. And, you know, um, I'm very self-conscious that often, you know, teaching at the university, we're insulated from all of that. And so I just wanted to thank you for being there on the front lines and, and getting us out of our power. <laughs> um, so my name is David Garneau. I'm a professor of uh, painting and drawing at the University of Regina. And I'm originally from uh, Beaver Hills, Edmonton, Treaty 6. And I'm Métis. My, I descend from Eleanor and Lawrence Garneau for the Garneau district that's underneath the campus of the U of A is uh, named for uh, the high-level bridges. And they originally, they met in Red River. And he's, he, she was born there. And he came originally from Sault Ste. Marie on the American side. Uh, so I was born and raised in Edmonton. Um, knowing that history, but not calling myself Métis, it was just sort of like a family history thing. Uh, then uh, when I was about 17, 18, I moved to Regina, I mean, to, sorry, to Calgary, and then to Regina 21 years ago in 1999. And one of the first things I did is uh, I wanted to, you know, we're uninvited guests when we're in these other territories, and you want to get a sense of the lay of the land and, you know, look at historical markers and so on. And of course, uh, I was very surprised that we have Regina, we've got the Queen Street and King Street and Princess Street and Victoria Square. And then going there, knowing Riel's history, you know, I wanted to pay homage, find out where he was hung and all that stuff. And to see a statue of John A. McDonald in the square was um, just a shock. I was just, I thought it was like a joke, you know, it was very surprising. And and all I'm here to talk about is, is I mean, I'll talk about how, how it's bad art. We'll go into that later. but. I, I want to talk about just the affect, the feeling it had. And it was a personal one. I didn't know if it was shared at all. I definitely didn't talk to anybody about it. But on November 16th, uh, which is the anniversary of rails being hung in Regina on the RCMP barracks grounds uh, for treason, um, I just decided to do a personal action. I'm an artist, not really a performance artist, but I made these little nooses and I would put them at his feet. And one year I put a full size one. And it was just a personal reaction. And I thought, you know, maybe someone will see it and they'll get the connection that I'm trying to make. But I, I never thought it would tell you to really go and do something public. I, I just didn't know. I'm a, I was also a guest here, so I didn't know how I stood in relation to other first, uh, other Indigenous folks and the Métis. Uh, I didn't just didn't know how people would take that. So I just would mostly, you know, avoid the, avoid the park. And then uh, about seven years ago, I thought I ought to do something. You know, I'm an artist. I've got responsibilities. And so I approached um, uh, the woman. You know, they have the Louis Riel trial um, since 1967 as well. And I approached the lady who makes the suits for, for Riel. And I asked her to make me two suits. One is a felt suit for winter and a, and a golden suit that um, I would wear. And I, I had sort of loosely formed a performance idea in mind. I thought I'd go to the airport or stand in the park and hand out little nooses that had tags on them that said uh, souvenir of Regina, just to in, in, sort of start the conversation going. But I'm a shy person and I, I didn't want to do that. So I thought, okay, whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to have to wear a hood. So I, I put on a hood 
and uh, started coming up with some ideas. Again, kind of shy, I didn't want to talk, so it was going to be a silent thing. So I came up with this performance. I was approached at the same time by Blair Fornwald, who's a curator, one of the curators at Dunlop Art Gallery, which is right on the park. I said I want to do something, and just everything came together. So in uh, 2014, for that anniversary of Riel's Hunt Hanging, um, I did this performance. And I'll just tell you a little bit about it, but basically Riel comes in with a hood on and he's wearing that felt coat. He's got a rope tied with a bunch of money bags because John A. personally tried to pay him off to stay in the States and not cause trouble. And, and uh, it's like the clearing the plane story, you know, he, he had a family, he had to subsist, but he took the money and he shouldn't have. And so he's returning that money. And then uh, he's appealing to uh, John A., you know, and he's holding the same pose with the scroll and he's trying to plead his case. And really, you know, John A., of course, is saying nothing, doing nothing. So Riel realizes that there's no point in going to that authority, but also it's counterproductive to stand as a statue and an emblem himself. And so rather than being uh, creating a counter monument or an argument, he turns his back on it. He puts a, a Métis sash around his eyes so he can't see what's happening next. And then he makes a teepee and performs a smudge ceremony and then packs up his belongings and, and leaves the park. And uh, I was invited to do the same performance the next January in, uh, by a curator, uh, Aaron uh, Sutherland, who's Métis, and she was working, uh, going to school at Kingston, and that's John A's hometown. And then later, when they were doing that hideous Riel opera, I was invited to do the similar action at the um, uh, John A. statue in, in Ottawa next to the uh, Parliament buildings. And by that point, I felt I was, it was just turning into an act. And uh, well, some people were moved for sure, but I didn't want to do it anymore. But a few years later, I was invited, CBC TV wanted to revive this discussion of the monument. So I did it again. I got a chance to bring out the gold suit. And this time, I had a firmer idea that I really wanted the statue gone. Really, I didn't know what I wanted before. I just wanted to avoid it. And in that performance, I spoke in, in the gold suit and I tried to convince, uh, so I'm as real as a statue, trying to convince Johnny as a statue that we ought to retire and we can talk forever in a museum face to face, but this is disturbing the, the future, the lifestyle, that any kind of conciliation wasn't gonna happen if, if he was gonna be there. But even if, if Riel was gonna be there, um, you know, the monuments to, as, as Kelly mentioned, monuments to humans are counter to in, indigenous ways of knowing and being. Um, so at this point, that's my interest. And, and Kelly, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I would like to see a substitute, but not a European style monument. Um, I'll just raise this quickly. It'll come up later. But um, the, the action plan for reconciliation has a few things about art, not much, but one of them is to create monuments. And really it's following the European mode. Almost all the reserves I've been to, they, they have a big rock with words on it. And uh, that's not a good thing to do with uh, grandfathers for one thing, but also it's uh, not being imaginative, it's not thinking. And so the idea of making a, a garden of indigenous medicines, I think is great because it will require care, constant returning and visiting and uh, something that, what I haven't heard anybody defend the real, I mean, the John A. statue because they're not visiting, they just in principle. Anyways, that's enough for me. Thank you, uh, Miigwech, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, David. Now we'll hear from Janine. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanna thank you for inviting me to come and and speak on this panel and also to reflect on the work that I had done in Regina prior to uh, working here at the Banff Center. I'd like to position myself as an Indigenous mother and someone who really focuses on storytelling and, and methodology and also how art was really key to a lot of the work that I had done uh, while working for the Regina Indian Industrial School uh, Media Project. And so I'm gonna backtrack into how I got into here because I, I, I don't have a script and I, I just kind of wanted to come and share. Uh, so 
I was one of the statement gatherers for the Truth and Reconciliation. And in that process, I learned that there's very diverse perspectives on what Indigenous identity is and what is needed to heal from this. But for one of the toughest things I found was listening to the different truths that everybody shared and how I realized that I was impacted as a, as a mother and how that made me really proactive in thinking about the future that I wanted for my kids. And after spending, it was like many years of just listening to statements, when the calls to action came out, they kind of come off as, you know, policy, bylaw, like paperwork basically. But when I read those, I actually hear stories of people who shared stories with me. So they were very real to me. And I think for myself going through that journey, when the seven national events were done, for me, the work wasn't done yet. I feel like we just opened up this, basically opened up the wound, but we needed to really take time to, to work through what we were feeling and responding to. And one of the things that I know from my work as a TRC is we talk about vicarious trauma and listening in terms of when you're hearing that, you're impacted by what you're hearing. And so, you know, I had to take time in doing my work to, to seek counseling and to get healing because the lateral abuse is there, racism is there, and, you know, it's very difficult to go through these processes. And for myself, when I came back home, uh, one of the projects that were pitched was they wanted to make everyone aware that there was uh, the Regina Indian Industrial School just on the outskirts of what was the city that had children all across Northwest Territories. And looking at John A. McDonald, even though the school opened on the year he died in 1891, his legacy was carried on through these schools. And the stories that I heard there were quite diverse. There were some where people were really taking the education, going to their communities, and were some of the people leading some of the nonprofits that Regina now sees. Uh, there was also a wave of urban Indigenous people who were now forming their own identity and often couldn't connect with their community. And that was really a shift in terms of how people viewed themselves. And, the first wave of people really didn't feel like they fit into the city and then they go home and they didn't really feel like they fit into the home because of how those policies impacted them. And one of the main things that were really key was to take away our, our dance, our ability to dance, our ceremony. And what my mom taught me is we don't really have a concept for art because it's living and it's functional, but we have developed the concept of art over the years. And I'm really very much interested in how we use art to share our stories and to speak to these concepts, just like David did with his piece. That's how I first started to become aware of the history because it's one of those things you kind of walk by and you don't always think about, just like the cemetery was something that people drove by and didn't realize it was a cemetery. So for myself in doing that, I think what I learned is it's the methodology and how you do the work that was super important. And at the TRC, they were always reevaluating re their approach, but they realized when you go into one community, it's not gonna be the same for the next community. So it was important to be kind of responsive in that way. And working for the cemetery, that was super important because of the expanse of how far the reach the school really had. And so when I first started, it was actually, I was really looking for leadership in terms of who is leading the cause. So I actually sat on a lot of city council meetings and listened to a ton of stuff. And this was kind of fit in within, at first it was at the end of the agenda and then slowly it became more of a priority and we could get through it a little faster which was you know, really important, but the reality was, I don't know how many hours I've sat in those meetings and, and I think what for me was, what I thought was just creating a documentary and 
bringing awareness actually became several years of my life in terms of not only creating the film, sitting at city council, meeting with different working groups with both church and the First Nations working group. Uh, there was many different, I guess, committees that started coming up in different places and the formation of the RISE commemorative was actually a motion made by the RISE First Nations working group. And what we wanted was to put everybody at the table because everybody was doing work differently, but they were all doing really great work and it was not to take away from their approach. It was to make everybody aware that we can support each other's approaches. And for me, that was really important, was to really facilitate a space that is both giving people respect, but allowing people to speak and to be heard. And so one of the biggest values that I have as a person and as a mother, but also in my work is to really listen to what's being said out there. And that's actually how I became familiar with Carrie in her work is that, you know, I started to see her going out there, another mother just really wanting to bring awareness to this important initiative that she was really bringing up. And so in doing that work, you know, we did get municipal provincial designation and the RCMP did do a land swap for the cemetery. But for me, in that process, I actually burned out quite a bit. I have to admit the work was really hard on me, on my family. I lost a lot of friends who are now in the spirit world and far more than I can count on my hand. So for me to take it from the beginning to the end was, was really hard, but I wasn't alone on that journey. And I think that's super important. But one of the elders who um, was on the original board she passed away and her dying wish was to see that site protected. And so I really take that to heart and to all the people who contributed their stories and that are now in the spirit world. I think we got to remember that the foundation of the work that's out there, there's people who kind of started things and trying to build on that and to respect that work was super important, but to welcome an open table so that the conversation can keep happening. And so in my journey, I also, I was actually a part of the Reconciliation Regina processes. So I was actually a participant in the community work that led to the nonprofit. And I was its first president for the first part of the year. And the teachings that we learned from the Regina Indian Industrial School in that process fed into the work. And I think that was something that kind of makes it a living initiative. And I really wish the group well, but I do think as David mentioned, it is worth reading the community action plan. And because it is a living document, how can we really take that document and that initiative to make sure that people aren't forgetting that this is important as well, that we need to start thinking about what is the story of Regina and how can we change that story not that we neglect the truth. I mean, we all can do our research and see, you know, the, that McDonald's dream to get a train and build a nation, the process really hurt and impacted a lot of people. And because I see myself as someone who is continuously on my healing journey, I do acknowledge that from a young age, I was impacted by abuse different types of abuse. Then as I got older, I experienced other kinds of abuse that led to, and I would say it was called grooming that started really young, but a lot of it is silence. And I'd like to really focus on there's listening and then there's silence and that there can be a supremacy in silence and not responding and not hearing what's being said and acknowledging other people's experiences. So for myself, listening as part of it but responding in meaningful ways is super important so the film we made you know got to see got to be screened around the world and unfortunately my colleague who was part of that film and part of this journey has passed away last year and because it's not a year yet many of you might already know who i'm speaking to but you know, we had each other through that process. And I think that was really important in terms of being able to start 
the journey and being able to finish, not that it's done, it's just I needed to follow dreams with my kids. So that's why I am where I am today. But I think looking at the action plan, one of the important parts I see is opportunity. And it's in, I, I, didn't, I don't like reading scripts, anybody who knows me, but um, if you take a look, you know, they're talking about opportunities to address and how can we do it in a meaningful way. And I, I kind of moved my setup when we started because of the lighting, but uh, it's section three opportunities, number 13, explore opportunities to promote and support reconciliation focused outcomes. So I feel like there's an opportunity here and there's also an opportunity to build community and to acknowledge the truth, but change the narrative and not just for us, but for future generations, because I would love my children to walk through Regina and have their children have a different history that we don't have to learn in university. Like those public art, you know, that to me is sharing a story and we get exposed to them just like I seen that John A over and over again and didn't really think too much about it, but it basically informed how I see Regina. So, you know, I think it's time to, to shift our narrative. And yeah, so that's kind of where I'd like to wrap up. And I really think, you know, hearing, you know, from Adam who really speaks as an artist, I think we all can connect with art. I think, yeah, I think I'd like him to build on, on whatever he wants to say, but, you know, he represents indigenous artists and I have a lot of respect for all the panelists here today. So I want to thank you for inviting me in and yeah, I'll sit back and, and listen. So. Thank you, Jane, and you've already um, seen them to Adam. So Adam, I'll let you uh, uh, speak now. Adam, hold your taskbar down. Classic full paw, not unmuting. The, um, uh, my name is Adam Martin. I am Guinea Cahaga, aboriginally from Six Nations of the Grand River, which is in Southern Ontario. Uh, I immigrated to Treaty 4 Regina in 2005 and uh, for the First Nations University of Canada and I got uh, really entrenched in the, in the community. Uh, I had done some traveling before and never really got to know the community except for here I, and, and stayed. And to be honest, I thought, you know, moving around that, you know, Indians were Indians, we were all skins here in the same game. Coming here though, about three months in, I went through a, a, an incredible amount of culture shock. Uh, like these people are not where I'm from. They, they are everywhere and they, and there's so much more going on and so different, um, which is part of, I think, part of the problem in the narrative uh, around these statues and removing them. Uh, there's, um, I was doing some hasty research uh, to get caught up on some things. I'm not a historian. I, you know, uh, did some light reading. Uh, I actually did a little bit more research when I was in the First Nations University TP liner project. And I was given the, uh, the uh, residential school TP it was uh, incredibly difficult. Um, uh, it's, it's put away, but um, that's when I got into the basis of uh, the residential schools, Dudney and John A and how close they were. Um, so when I was uh, making some notes, I'm, I'm more attuned with what, you know, is happening now, I suppose. Uh, I'm active. I don't, um, I don't shy away from, you know, uh, the, the racism on, on social media. Uh, you know, it's, it's actually amusing most of the time. And so I was gonna lean towards this uh, white fragility and white privilege sort of uh, narrative that's, that's what we're really up against. The, and sure enough, there's a guy in the Q and A, and I'm pretty sure I know who he is because he came up when we tried, well, not that person specifically, it could be. We tried a cultural appropriation panel a couple of years ago and uh, there was a person that was quite vocal about like, this is a one-sided thing. And, uh, you know, where's all the opposition? This isn't fair. So there's a lot of whining and crying from the, uh, in particular, the European Canadian population. And um, I think there is some parallels. I mean, if there was a statue of, or even we all know about it, I mean, it's very difficult to 
you want to be careful when you're speaking about people you have respect for, elders in the community, living or past. Um, uh, I, I, th I thought that was important to mention. So, because I did find uh, on YouTube the agenda with Steve Pakin from 2015. It was Sir John A. at 200. So there was a panel of these uh, uh, five people, um, two female, one, the one, one female was uh, Canadian uh, Chinese and uh, the rest were white, of course. So it was really like disturbing, like watching how these guys, they were, they were just total fanboys, uh, writers and historians, very knowledgeable, but they were all kind of like united in, in like, uh, you know, really, uh, really getting off on like this pride and, and, and that they have for the guy, like, like they grew up with him. Um, pretty disturbing stuff. So, uh, but the Asian, the uh, Chinese Canadian woman whose name I forgot, she actually brought up John Dashcut, Dashcox. Is it? Yeah, sorry, Dashcox, Clearing the Plains. Anyway, she brought up that book. It was a new book then. And she spoke up for, you know, the indigenous community and, and really tried, but they were very dismissive, of course. I mean, and that's what it's all about, white fragility, white privilege. It's, it's, uh, and this guy in the Q&A is obviously an expert. Again, it doesn't matter what anybody says, uh, you know, they're gonna go full Karen. So we can let him do that. Uh, but he, he, I can answer to his cries about, uh, assuming he's a male, um, about, you know, an opposition. So growing up, uh, I didn't really care about Canadian history, I don't, I still don't. I mean, uh, call it being traditional Mohawk or not, I don't, I really don't care. If there's a statue in the park, I, it doesn't really bother me. Um, but knowing the history, knowing that it's there, and now that I know about John A, I mean, when these relics are up in, the, in communities and you're calling for reconciliation, th those things are gonna keep people out still. I mean, why do you have to look at it? Why do you have to go to a park to have a good time and then your, your kids say, who's that? And then, well, you know, another long, sad story of, of being Canadian. Um, so um, so uh, I, I thought that like uh, this discussion is around removal. But um, in speaking with the city a few weeks ago, um, they, they were quite open-minded. And, and they're behind schedule because uh, uh, of the COVID. So, so when the protest started in front of City Hall over there with those two ladies um, and, you know, they, 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 they started pulling together some, some meetings and some uh, 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 input from the Indigenous community and I was glad to partake. Um, so what I was really happy about, what I thought gave that, that group uh, credence and respect was they're not just going to try and melt it down and, you know, destroy it and have a big party. Um, they were willing to like, they, they were trying to explore ways to put it somewhere else. And, and, and it, never mind a museum. I mean, uh, th their answer was to move it to uh, the legislative gardens, which, you know, what's wrong with that? I mean, who, who, could, who could really take insult and problem and, and whine and cry about that? But then uh, what I found out was, um, was asked when I asked where Louis Riel was actually hanged. And apparently where where that statue is situated, John A, it's like within feet. It, it, I, I, as I'm told, I wasn't there, I don't know. It was like in the middle of, the, of that street, as I, I'm told, David Shiggity said. <laughs> but somebody from the city explained that to me. So this is just my, what I, what I, what I know, sorry. Um, so I thought like that's a really kind of a Trump thing to do, you know, uh, you know that uh, I'm in control, I'm in power, like this, we're gonna put this here so that it's gonna remind everybody of, of like everything. So. Um, I'm not sure what the connection is uh, to legitimize a statue of Johnny in, in, uh, in Regina, other than being a Canadian city or the capital of the province, uh, I suppose is enough. Uh, to move it uh, to, the, to the grounds, I thought did it much more respect um, to the legislative grounds. Um, I thought it w was a happy medium. Um, there was some talk about like responsive art, you know. Um, the city was also open-minded to using our funding this year because our, our events are canceled with our city funding to, uh, I wanted to do some performances, uh, well, we could, uh, in, in response to the statue. It's an idea of Bounce Around. I haven't gotten onto it yet, but they're open to that. And, but then again, I always have to keep in the back of my mind, like who's gonna be there? 
Who's going to be crying around? Who's going to be upset? When are the Karens going to come out? And it's going to be my responsibility. How am I going to handle that? You know, because I have to maintain some sort of air of professionalism in my job. And, you know, you can't just be yelling and bashing people all the time. I mean, you go crazy. So, um, yeah, I think, I think like the, the, what we're up against is, is this pride and it's justified. I think we can all respect that. You know, simple answers like uh, putting a, a, a statue of a, a chief across from him. It will, well, then which chief, uh, who and how big and then who's going to make it? And then, uh, you know, who's involved? Are they going to, who's going to fund it? Who's going to do it right? Um, uh, uh, I think my immediate answer would be, uh, you know, we could do it ourselves. We could do it on our own. It could be done through Sagay Walk. Um, <laughs> We, you know, the, the, the First Nation University is a monument to itself, in itself, you know, uh, to the people and to the province, uh, to this country, uh, uh, how far things have come. Um, I'm, I'm really worried about, uh, um, I'm always worried about, you know, when is it going to be that I have to face off with some uh, hurt Karen out there that's screaming at my kids because, you know, they're brown. Or, you know, um, moving here, it's quite different. The attitude's quite different. Uh, it's definitely not a utopia back home. But um, it, it's, uh, it's becoming more prevalent, the, the, white, the, the white nationalism, the, the right. And it's really prevalent here. And uh, I think that's why we always have to be tiptoeing through the tulips with, with things like this, because we have to, like, do our part to educate everyone. But, you know, why is it always up to us? Why is it always up to the artists? What, uh, you know, the, the community workers, the knowledge keepers, when we're all involved in the same economic system, we're all involved in the same education system, there's all these promises up and down and money from the government and everything never changes. And so here we are, and I would invite everyone to that Q and A button if you can to see, because I, uh, I would actually support if you ever on a panel, um, I would, I would uh, support something where, yeah, so let's keep it there. So yeah, well, let's keep it there. Not, I mean, uh, but that's just personalized. The Ross Regimental School closed here. Oh, in uh, 1996. I'm having some internet problems, it looks like. But uh, I think I'll just conclude my rant with uh, those particulars. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam, and th thank you, uh, uh, Janine and David and Kerry, again, for uh, what you've shared with us. Um, we have uh, quite a bit of time for a question and answer uh, a session. Um, if some of you have followed uh, the community so far, um, uh, you've seen uh, um, a few exchanges already. Um, so um, I, I'm, I will bring up this question that has been asked uh, already, um, uh, which has to do with you know why we removed the, this uh, statue compared to other statues, right? So um, what we're reading here is that uh, dating back to before the classical age, immortalization of leaders and man as an abstract ideal had existed. Uh, museums in Europe and beyond are filled with statues of Roman emperors, many of whom uh, lived worse lives than the late Prime Minister McDonald. Traditions across the world have iconographs of their leaders uh, immortalized. The iconographs and statues are just that, rather two-dimensional representations of the historical figures they depict, often awarded based on a specific aspect of their lives or even a small collection of deeds. Um, these statues are not put up for the people of today to look back on their lives as a Bible of sorts, rather they are put up by the people of the time to represent a cultural ideal of that time. It is not, it is not his genocidal endeavors that Johnny is immortalized for, Rather, it is his role in the construction of this country. This in mind, what good does it really do to remove history rather than increase the transparency for the fogs of time? Um, so I'll, uh, I'm happy to let any of you, as David's already unmuted himself, so I'll let you uh, begin. Yeah, I, those are very good points. And certainly not all the statues from all ages have survived, right? So people take it upon themselves regularly you call them icons and it's called iconoclasm. And the iconoclasm is the destruction of your own idols because you no longer believe what they stand for. So that's a thing. Um, and often the things that are kept are so beautiful that you forget what they represent in terms of the, the individual person, but you're so intrigued by that. This one doesn't rank 
So it's interesting. If you go to the statue of John A. in uh, uh, his hometown, it's actually quite beautiful. It's raised up really high. And the one in Ottawa is gorgeous. It's up higher. I'd have a hard time on the art aesthetic side removing those. This one's not very well made, not very interesting. Um, it's only good quality for me is that he's down low so you can address him, you can put things around his head or whatever you want. The other ones are quite high up. But also it's important to realize that that statue wasn't put there when John A died, right? It was decades, decades later. It's a 1967 project. It's also wasn't put up there by um, indigenous folks collecting the hat, you know, and collecting money and, and, and building it because they really wanted to celebrate the guy and it wasn't the Chinese Canadians. It's a white statue of a white man for white people. And that's why I think white folks should decide to support it or take it down and have their reasons rather than the generic ones. Um, it, it's, it's your statue. You figure out what to do with it. That's why I have mixed feelings. I have suggestions, but uh, it's your thing. Um, but it was built in 1967. It was placed in the city where Riel was hung. You don't find one anywhere else in Saskatchewan. In Alberta, where I'm from originally, there isn't one there. There isn't one in Manitoba. There isn't one in Western Ontario. There isn't one in all of British Columbia. There was one in Victoria. They put up for a while. The Indigenous folks complained. They took it down. So in all of Western Canada, the statue is only at the place where Riel was hung and just south of the atrocities in Battleford. That's not an accident. That's a provocation. And that's why it's irritating. You know, you can ignore a lot of things, but this is a deliberate pro provocation of white Canada against Indigenous Canada. And it, it really can't stand. And if we want to keep it standing, it's not for these generic reasons about it's an artwork. No one's actually made that statement um, that he was a pretty good guy, except for these miserable things. Um, well, then contextualize it, sure. But those aren't the reasons it's there. It's there as a provocation to Indigenous people to say, shut up, watch out, or you're going to get payback. And Carrie's put her body on the line there, and she saw it played out in real life. That's all I have to say. Does anybody else also want to answer this question? Pardon? I just wanted to make the observation, the, uh, those antiquity statues, they were often painted. They were colorful and skin tones were correct and such. They were just the, under, they were under the paint, the paint wore off. I don't know. That's in order to make them white, Adam. <laughs> the original ones actually did have a, quite a range of skin tones. That's, re that's a really important observation. And the white, there's some wonderful articles online about the whiteness of the statues. And again, that was in the 19th century that that was uh, promoted, right? And that, that this is the birth of um, race as an idea, as, a, as an ontological hierarchy of humans. So we didn't um, uh, set out this um, event as a, as a dialogue. Um, the goal of the event isn't to have a debate and definitely not to settle the issue. Right? It's about sharing a few views that we don't often hear at length. Right? This is not, we don't have an hour, an hour and a half um, in the media uh, about uh, um, uh, the views to, uh, to remove these statues. So we want to make sure to get that across. It's up to us here today to settle the issue, to decide who wins a debate, who is right and who is wrong. Um, uh, in that spirit, though, I will leave a, a couple of comments that are up in the question and answers here um, uh, that we will come back to eventually. Um, we do have a, another question here um, asking the panelists whether uh, you can speak to the importance of First Nations and Métis representation in Regina. Some people have called for another statue or a plaque to provide equal representation for Indigenous folks. I have my, I have, they have their own feelings about this proposed solution in this time of reconciliation. What does the panel think? Um, I'll just say, because we actually tried something, um, Frederick Dupre, a friend of mine and I wanted to do a counter monument uh, and have a real statue uh, in permanent dialogue or on the ledge land. I, I, we weren't sure. And we even approached Joe Fafar and he was game and he drew up the drawing for us and it was gonna be a real sitting on a big rock 
contemplating. And I love the design because it wasn't celebrating his leadership and masculinity. It was about this moment of doubt and crisis, kind of a Garden of Gethsemane moment. Um, but after doing the performance or after thinking about the performance that I was doing at Dress as Real, I realized we don't need another uh, metal man, you know, we don't need another hero um, in, a, in a dialogue. And also that representation silences all the, the women who are involved in the, the movement over time. But also it freezes Métis uh, in that 1885 moment uh, rather than the ongoing uh, struggles. And so it just, it put a bad taste in my mouth and, and we just didn't follow it through. One of the interesting things though is in going through the process and talking to the Wascana Park Authority, they let us know that there had to be some permanent organization that supported the object, the, the statue, and would take care of it over time. And that's what made me uh, think about, uh, Kelly and Denis were talking about this, about other kinds of monuments and the idea of a garden. And, and maybe we could pass it on to that. But from an Indigenous point of view, you, on the plains, again, Adam, I don't know what the Mohawks have for statues and stuff, but on the plains, um, you didn't make monuments to individual people at all. And uh, uh, the idea of permanence wasn't important. But the notion of Indigenous visiting, of a cyclical coming, going through power, or coming back through ceremony and all of this is totally uh, makes sense. So the idea of a garden that has a cyclical nature and that it requires care and visiting and that if it no longer meets the needs, it dies off rather than stays there is an important Indigenous uh, counter proposal. And I would love to hear more about that. I'll chime in quickly uh, just to respond. Um, there, there is a statue of Joseph Brandt, Captain Joseph Brandt, Chief Joseph Brandt, uh, named um, in the city of Brantford, where I grew up uh, with the high school in Victoria Square. It's really tall and uh, it's a monument to him um, and his part to play in helping to establish the borders as they exist now around the Great Lakes. And uh, I've recently found out that he's, uh, he was a slave owner. Um, there's no dialogue going on around about that. Uh, it should be happening. I mean, why not? And so, again, a much more uh, larger piece. Um, uh, for the when I heard about the removal, I immediately thought about the gardens in the ledge and area, and I thought it would be beautiful if uh, if John A was there, it, that statue, and surrounding him was a a, a garden of uh, native prairie plants and herbs and, and medicines. Um, it would be like a double-edged sword. Uh, it would keep the, uh, it would keep the, uh, you know, the triggered fragile people happy that he's there surrounded in his garden and, and, and all the good that he did for indigenous people, right? As part of their beliefs. But then, you know, to see John A surrounded by in a native garden um, and those medicines and, and probably frequented if there's sage and such growing there. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's still, it's very symbolic without interrupting the land with uh, some, some commission piece. But but, um, I wonder if uh, Kerry and Jane uh, had any uh, thoughts about um, this, um, uh, this, other, uh, this idea of an other statue or plaque um, to provide uh, equal representation of different views. Uh, well, I don't necessarily have an idea of what can replace it, but I, I like to go back to the methodology and the conversations. Because I mean, in the Q&A, yes, we're, we're hearing chats and I really refrain from, from labeling people. So, you know, I think the more important thing is what are the ideas coming out and how is this an opportunity for education? Because I do think what I learned from RISE and the work that we've done is the film helped create a discourse that wasn't there before and then other people were brought in and added to that discourse and now I know and from what I've been told it's been basically put into the education system with not only our youth but in the university levels and so you know that process that I mentioned before can be really important in terms of building relationships and I think whatever ends up being there and maybe it's supporting an idea like having prairie um, 
natural plants there is important because I know in Hawaii when I went there they were actually removing foreign plants and that was how they were going back and honoring their past and so there's all these possibilities and for me you know this is a forum we can sit and chat and talk about it from the different perspectives but you know where can this conversation go and I, I do I, I mean I've worked with the city in every initiative initiative that I have. And what I know is the more people who speak and the more people who who participate in the conversation and the more groups that come up and respond to the initiative, it puts more pressure so that people can speak. So when I seen Carrie, you know, going out there, you know, it, it did put more pressure and I did hear that they were looking back and kind of moving through it. But, you know, COVID did put a standstill on on a lot of people's lives. And so I think, you know, now that the conversation's coming back, you know, where can it go after this is the question that I have. Go ahead, get it, Carrie. Um, I, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I think, um, I still strongly believe and um, because I was raised in a home where they taught religion, that in the Bible, it says not to idolize um, anything like that. So this garden idea is actually, I agree with Jen Jenine that we can, um, if somehow I could be involved with discussions with the city, which like I said, there's so much paperwork and everything to go through to get to that point. Like um, that in itself is a battle to get them to talk to me, you know? So um, like, I mean, I get the same output from them that I always get some automated message. And I feel that if there was a group of us that could approach the city with the gardening idea maybe we can take that if the statute is coming down which uh talking with the mayor um i have a good relationship with him um i try to be fair that is the one thing that um so when we started this statue it wasn't just tear it down and burn it we had the idea of um moving it uh, maybe taking it apart and putting it you know, into something else considered art, you know, or, and there was a lot of negative ideas that we had to sidestep at the statue, you know, like we want to go along with the, um, the radical idea, you know, but at the same time to promote fairness and to show the community that we are fair people and that we just don't want to see the statue. As a matter of fact, I don't want to see any statues unless I go to a museum, unless I go to a place of artwork. So I'm just hoping that, um, yes, that idea is recognized that we are making those choices ahead of time and not just trying to tear it down. Like, you know, like that people should accept the positives that we are uh, producing. That's all. Good to, to move on to the next question that's related to, to this. Um, uh, I've, I have a couple of questions going in this direction here. Basically, um, uh, you're being asked, uh, how do you feel about what should happen to the statue once it's, uh, um, uh, once it, if it is removed? How do you feel about it uh, going to a museum, perhaps? Um, it could be the, the RCMP Heritage Museum here, as somebody suggested, or to a different uh, art uh, museum. No strong, no strong feelings, <laughs> Janine? Yeah, uh, well, you know, as one who, you know, worked at the McKinsey Art Gallery for many years and in different, and really do love educating my kids through art, you know, the, to have that piece go there, that's fine and can be curated within a certain narrative, you know, and be presented in that way. And I think the more important part is like, it's more about the ideas and where it's placed. And, you know, it is a very prominent 
space and we call that our like that's our gathering space in Regina so we have a lot of events there so you know I have no I guess I have no issue with it going to a gallery there's a lot of pieces in the many galleries that I've seen that can be triggering and you know often I think of and actually because David's here I was actually a story keeper in one of the exhibitions that him and Michelle Lavalle did called Moving Forward Never Forgetting and some of those pieces were made by Indigenous artists, but there were also certain pieces that were triggering to other people. And I think, you know, for me, when I was talking about vicarious trauma, I'm also talking about triggers. And surprisingly, when his exhibition and I was sitting kind of a living storyteller in the gallery, you know, for me, that was really important in my understanding of you can have the piece there and you can have a panel there, but to have someone speak and have a conversation and a dialogue, I think that was the most important part of the exhibition and became quite a powerful lesson. Like I really wish the Mackenzie could have really continued with the story keeper methodology, but it definitely for myself changed my perspective of how art can be really important to really get that dialogue going, whatever it is. So, you know, I'm I'm totally supportive of it going into any museum who wants to house and to have it there to share that story. Yeah, I'm glad you raised that because I do want to talk a little bit about Indigenous methodologies, contemporary methodologies, as I understand them. You know, Carrie was talking about Indigenous folks didn't have, or maybe it was Janine was talking about the concept of art, but they made stuff, right? And it was all part of your living self. And the Western notion is that the object is separated from daily life and put in a special place to be looked at, um, not to be touched, not to be talked to, but Indigenous uh, folks, the touch is important, the dialogue with it, and the notion that it's part of a larger set of meanings and connections. And uh, when you explain that, when you show it like in the exhibition, moving forward, never forgetting, everybody gets it. You know, and it's just that this one mode that we call col colonial or Western or whatever has been a dominant mode, but these other modes are more humane and better, you know, better ways of being human. I don't know any elders that are going to say tear down that statue, you know, they, they don't, they don't talk that way about destructive, they talk about productive, how are we going to produce new relationships, how are we going to produce a place that we all want to live in. And so focusing on the statue and taking it down, that's gonna ruffle feathers and make people upset. And I, I, I'm really sorry about that, um, that, you, that you feel that way. And, and um, I think that what I'm reading in these comments is people doing some soul searching about why they wanna defend the, the guy in the statue. And that's a good thing. If you start interrogating the things that are important to you that you didn't take, uh, that you just took for granted before, um, you probably will become closer to changing your mind. But also, no one's taking care of John A, that statue, that, that being really. And maybe it needs to be in a special place of care, whether it's a museum or the RCMP barracks or wherever it is. And people can do homage to it, you know, and, and see who those people are. Um, but I think that there, he needs to be taken care of in a better way than he is now. Go ahead, okay. 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 Um, that's actually um, kind of funny because when, while we were standing out by the statue, we almost felt like we were babysitting it. Um, be, you know, it was just weird because, you know, I'm there, tear it down. And like, you know, but we're trying to keep it safe. And, and yet it seemed to have gone through more um, vandalism. So which we were trying to save that, you know, have people, you know, leave it alone and stuff, but we want it removed. And we're trying to put that out there that we were not for tearing it down and making, um, you know, the way America was going and with their statues and stuff, we were trying to do it fairly. So just to bring up that point. And you just heard there, um, we, we do have time for more questions, so please don't hesitate to ask them in the Q&A. If you do have questions, please put them in, in the Q&A. I uh, just want to make sure that uh, we, uh, we have time for a variety of questions here. Um, I'll take the next one here. Um, it's a question about uh, public perception and the role of the media. Um, 
no matter how often we tell this story in this day of social media, the comments, and we've heard about that, the comments towards anyone who wants to remove are harsh and negative. The amount of racist comments is disturbing. What message do you have for mainstream Saskatchewan media when covering this issue? Um, I want to follow up on a point Adam made earlier, and that's this notion that, um, I can't remember how you phrased it, Adam, but it was about being in these places, you know, Indigenous person in Regina or Indigenous person at the university or at the Mackenzie Art Gallery or wherever. And I certainly felt that when I first moved here and even when I was doing my education in Alberta, that, um, but that's changed, you know, things have actually changed. And what I feel now is that there are these networks happening and, and online helps a lot, uh, but there's networks of people sharing their ideas, not being in a debate in public and being shut down, but nurturing and growing these ideas of what it means to be a contemporary indigenous person, how these are, I was so happy to hear um, Carrie, you aligning things with uh, John A's res response to Chinese Canadians and the idea of wanting to preserve an Aryan race and so on. Uh, and even Martin Adams' um, comment about uh, slave ownership and the complexity of Indigenous uh, complicity within colonialism. We have to have all those conversations. And what I've noticed since I was a kid anyways, you know, back in the days of 1970s and Touch the Earth on radio, on CBC radio and programs like that where you What's this? You know, now you hear a lot of indigenous narratives and, and music, and and it's not in a patronizing way usually, um, but there are actually physical changes. And and so what I see is there's, yes, there's an assimilation integrationist methodology happening, but there's also this parallel system, this indigenous art world, this indigenous critical world, this world of indigenous care that runs parallel within through but it also has many strands that are separate from and not being overheard by non-Indigenous folks or non-BIPOC folks. And that's world changing. And so I think these collaborations with Black communities, uh, Asian, you know, uh, other BIPOC folks are, are certainly the future and understanding our complexity uh, that we're not some kind of unified Pan-Indian whole. Those are really important. So in terms of media, it's just more, more, more. <laughs> complex, complex, complex. That's the, that's, the, that's the future. In the meantime, though, there's all kinds of stories and threads that are not going to make it into the, the tip of the iceberg that is the media um, that are generating slowly over time and underground or through um, chat forums and other, uh, other sites. Um, but I think that's important. It's just more. Thank you, David. Are there, are there other messages to the mainstream social media to covering the, the issue? Because they will be over the, the coming weeks and months. I'll address um, the racism. Um, it's like you can go and look for it now online. Um, and sometimes I will get right involved because this is like you read, okay, so you go to the leader post. And you'll see a, like a, a, an article about, I don't know, the grain prices went down. No one's discussing that. But if you go and put up this article about the statue, oh my goodness, the comments, it's crazy. So I guess what I'm saying is that you kind of have to self-regulate and uh, see what's important to you and what's, you know, like where you should step in and comment. And I've noticed that I could waste all day commenting on various issues, which could be the oil, it could be um, our foster kids, it could be missing and murdered. These are many things that I stand up for. And um, you wouldn't believe how much problems people have with like all of those. So um, I guess it's how you take care of yourself while you are um, addressing the racism across the media. That's pretty much what my opinion is. It's the importance of, of actually addressing it, right? And not just showing it. Right? Adam, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, like it's, um, any, any article to do with indigenous, indigeneity is uh, often attacked. And it's, you know, 90% of the time is just really, you can tell there's just really simple uh, stuff that not really thought through or well read. It's more of a reaction and uh, it can be viewed as racist. Uh, otherwise, um, sometimes it is blatantly racist. Uh, and I, most of the time it is just sort of veiled, you know, I'm, 
Um, but uh, I think it, it's, I, I do have confidence that, you know, there is a small group out there, a smaller group that whatever steps they have to take for themselves to move beyond and past uh, talking about John A. McDonald's statue as being you know, offensive, um, proposing the idea of removing it is, if it's offensive, you know, I think there's a, a, a very narrow group of people that are, I'm, I'm very confident there's a lot more people that are open-minded, I'm sure. I'm sure most people don't even care. I mean, you know, but we do, we are here to take care uh, it, for it, for what it, it means. And it's a part of this whole thing is recognizing um, it, it's legitimate and that people who have feelings and it's, and the connections to history, it's, it's, it's fine. And we're a part of that. And, uh, you know, come into the discussion, I think is, um, I hope there's opportunities, uh, with more opportunities for more people to, especially the European Canadian population that may have problems with it. I, I, I'm sure they'll have their fair say. And um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful and that it will be resolved. Uh, yeah, in terms of like my experience of dealing with the media for uh, the Regina Indian Industrial School, like for myself, I've seen, you know, many different approaches and um, personally, on my end, I just ignore all the comments because generally they're just people who are, you know, there to argue and they're not really giving you stories or anything that's educating you. So, you know, that was my way of doing it. And my former collaborator, she loved to read them because she felt like we got to respond to these in our movie. So, you know, one of the comments that really stuck with us was when it came to the cemetery and why it was forgotten, the biggest comment that really stuck was, well, why don't Indigenous people care about their kids? And, you know, that really stuck with me because, you know, I'm raising, you know, two young men and I really care about my kid, but I know that there's systematic racism and, you know, different polity, I guess uh, policies that are still alive, like the child welfare system is still one we got to talk more about. And so, you know, for me, we responded to it into the film by talking about the generational gap that's there and how a lot of people were not living in Regina. A lot of them were actually spread across what is now Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta and didn't necessarily have that connection. And it was in oral stories, but it wasn't in the media. So how we worked with the media is we actually created an information package so people understood the steps and the conversations and how the process was moving along, kind of a living document that got added and was given to the city as well to help them see where we were coming from. And for me, that was important to do that because, you know, the reality is not everybody knows the work that was done before we got on the media that day. And so, you know, that was key, but also, you know, got to remember, not a lot of people even read the article that they're commenting on. They see the title and then they have all these big opinions and then you read into it and then you're like, okay, well, I don't think they even read the article because a lot of the things they're talking about are addressed in the article. But I also know that as media, there's good storytellers who are able to really, you know, get to the heart of a story. And then there's others who are just trying to get the story out there. So I've learned that there's really, and it's a tool and tools can be good and bad. And same with people, depending on, you know, their perspectives and understanding of the topic. So when I have a really good reporter, then I definitely, you know, will give them the one on one. And if I know someone's just going to turn what I'm saying into something else, because I've been taken out of context so many times that I just learned that that's not a person I'm going to go back to and give an interview. But the reality is, is I try not to give too much attention to comments and some places even shut the comments down. But if you're not moderating it, then, you know, you're just leaving it out there. And it's a reflection on, on your media outlet in terms of what you're leaving and let's sit. But it's a lot of work. So, I mean, I'm not complaining, but I know some people are more proactive in moderating, you know, just 
I guess, really harmful racist opinions versus something that's actually, you know, building on that conversation as it was intended to do, the comment section. So, yeah, just some thoughts. Uh, thank you, Jane. We have some great questions coming in late here. So here's what I'm going to propose uh, we do. Uh, we have three questions um, that we can maybe have one person answer each, whoever feels the most um, um, willing to answer it. And then we'll have the last question here by Alex uh, to finish our discussion. So this first one here, um, the, do you feel uh, that the longer the city of Regina takes to move forward with the discussions and our potential removal tells indigenous people of Regina that the opinions of Regina settler population supersedes the trauma and genocide? Which one of you wants to take this question? Um, no, like initially I thought, yeah, people are going to drag their heels and so not act in a panic mode. And I'm actually all for that. There are certain times where, um, for instance, in many cases in the States, uh, if you've ever been down in some of those places, um, the violence is so intense and daily and grinding um, that, that, that it, the fact that people reacted and took those things down, that just doesn't come as a surprise. Um, here, it's invasive and sedate and slow and casual <laughs> racism. And so I think the response should be in kind. And so I really like, I mean, I like reading through all these comments and people are really wrestling with, with issues, you know. They're, they're, they're not dealing with the emotions, they're dealing with the facts or as they perceive them. And as uh, Janine said, you know, let's go story to story. <laughs> you know, if you want to change people's mind, let's go story to story. And then you'll get a sense of why people feel a certain way. Uh, after one of the conversations I had, uh, like when we do the, these performances, we have a panel afterwards, often at the library or wherever. And uh, I was really quite impressed with, uh, uh, it was a lawyer came up and was talking about the importance of memorials, again, generally and his dad or grandfather being in the world war. And I totally agree with it. Um, but can you tell a story about John A? I got nothing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Let's go story to story. And so not having debates, I am not interested in having debates about these things, but go story to story. And then we can figure out where our common humanity is gonna be in the future, rather than how we need to memorialize the past. And this idea of a garden is precisely that. It acts as a memorial, a living memorial, but it isn't an icon that you're having to defend. Uh, it's a living relationship you're having to uh, attend to. Thank you, David. Um, next question that's not unrelated to this here. Uh, the seven both the US and UK statues that the one uh, you're discussing have been physically pulled down, sprinted, decapitated, even tossed into the sea or the, the, the river anyway. Um, in Regina, by contrast, the approach has been one of petition, protest, and debate. Um, do you have any reflections on this difference in approach? Does it come down to the indigenous stewardship approach that has come up several times during this panel? Maybe more broadly, how do you feel about the approach that's been taken here? Um, I, I wonder if it's, uh, I, I think it's part of the people that I do, yeah, I think it is, it is that, that there's, um, you know, a, a much more like a respectful ways. I, I, I feel I, my wife is from Pasco and our kids are from theirs. So, um, you know, getting to know their family. I mean, uh, again, and not to generalize too incredibly, but uh, I, I think it's, it is a little more about uh, cooperation and, and, and listening um, I, at the same time, it's, it, there, there, you can't deny the oppressiveness, uh, uh prevalent on the, the prairies, uh, Western Ontario, all the way to Okanagan. I mean, it's, it's hard. And, uh, and realizing that, I mean, I think, it, I think, I, I think that statue, if somebody really wanted that statue down, they would have found a way and did it by now. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, you know, people want to trust I and mean, people want to, again, believe that uh, things can be worked out. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's more to do with the people here, the, the, the real people that are here from here. 
um, to, to take the initiative in this way. Thank you, Adam. Um, the second last question here. Um, what are the panelists' thoughts on having a more diverse membership on the cities and universities groups that make decisions about displayed artworks, whether it's inside or outside? Yeah. yeah, no, I, I think that's a really great idea. I mean, there's, and I've been really, you know, thinking through this, that there's the ability to consult, but in order to reflect on it, you really do need someone sitting at the table who can speak and to elevate the conversation and, and reinforce those perspectives. So, you know, when you get the information back and it's on paper, Unfortunately, we all go back to our default and our worldview. So to have someone kind of keep challenging, and it's a process, so I'm not necessarily, you know, I think it's a great idea, let's put it that way. And I think it would really help move things forward and build and educate and put awareness internally and have that, ex, you know, reflect externally through art because, you know, I really think art reflects us as a community. So I think it's really important to consider that. Thank you. Ken, was there anything you wanted to add uh, um, after the last few uh, questions? So last question here, um, maybe for, for, for Kerry first, what other decolonization actions would you, would you like to see in the infrastructure of Regina? Um, so first of all, I'd like to address the racism. So once again, I'm going to push for that um, support for the racism um, event that we can hold. Uh, we can hold it in an open space with, of course, the COVID in mind, keeping the masks on, but we can enjoy ourselves together in this time. Um, I think that this call to action for a duty to be changed, the street name to be changed, should be in there. Um, and that we should be teaching more about, um, I guess, amongst the school and the education systems is to really push for uh, not exactly the leaderships, um, the mistakes of the leadership in the past, but to um, also put our leaders, the ones that stepped up and, uh, you know, alongside Riel and everyone, that we need to put those in the textbooks and uh, to make sure that our history is equally shared as well as, uh, yes, the men's. Thank you, Kerry. Um, any other uh, thoughts on this last question? Really? I just would like to say, just to keep the conversation going. I mean, this is one, you know, platform, and for those who have opportunity to keep that conversation ripple affecting into the community, so that education does happen. Because one thing I do love about Regina is once they stepped into understanding the issue of the Regina Indian Industrial School, they did the work and now there's a book out there, there's all kinds of stories, there's more coverage. So it's like, keep building the discourse and educating each other and, and don't stop here, just keep moving. So it's not really answering the question, it's just you know a final thought before we end. And thank you for your time to the panelists to yourself and to everybody who joined in today. It means a lot to me to participate in the conversation. So I'll follow Jane's uh, uh, lead here. And, uh, and here, since it is 4.30, 4 I'm going to allow myself a last thank you to our four uh, panelists. I'm very grateful for everything you've been willing to share and uh, uh, the way you've been answering questions. We're going to be holding some more um, sessions around questions uh, tied to living heritage. Um, over the, the fall and winter. Um, we'll have the full uh, schedule up before too long, I hope, on the Humanities Research Institute website. So I'll put that in the chat. Actually, I will put it in chat for everyone now because I put it to just one person. So now you can all actually see it. And I will also put links here again uh, in case you missed them 
to view the petition and learn more about the city's legacy review. These are ongoing projects. Um, I encourage you to have a look. So thank you again very much for uh, being here. I hope that uh, we'll uh, um, be able to exchange more in the future. Very grateful for this uh, dialogue and I am um, very much looking forward to where it's going to go in the future. Thank you.